First of all, before we start, we would like to thank the Agora Reworks Festival and Sphera for hosting this event and for inviting us. 2021 has been called uh, the year of the NFTs. And it's very important to understand that the NFT technology is still at a very early stage. Nevertheless, the goal of this speech is to shed some light into a complex topic and hopefully you get to enjoy this new technology as much as we do. Before we start, I would like to introduce us really quick. My name is Max and I'm from Germany. Those are my colleagues, Vlad, Vlad and Andro from Greece. Hello everyone. Hi guys. We are the founding members of Rare Candy. Today our team comprises of 11 members from a bunch of European countries but we also have members in Asia, Latin America, and Africa. Nevertheless, we're very proud to be here as a European-based project. I would like to ask you two questions really quick. First of all, who here has heard about the term blockchain? Please raise your hand. Oh, wow, that's more than half of you. Who here has heard about the term NFT before? That's about the same people, more than half. Very nice. If you go to the next slide, I'm gonna tell you really quick what we're gonna be talking about today. First, we're gonna give some general introduction to NFTs. We're gonna look at the underlying technologies. We're gonna look at some potential use cases and we're gonna look at some statistics. After this, we're gonna dive into rare candy at NFTs and art, pardon, where we're gonna have a live demonstration and show you some more details about exactly the intersection between NFT and art. After this, we wanna take you through a very quick tour of what it is that we do at rare candy and how we work with artists. And at the end, there will be some time for some questions. So now, my colleague Andro is gonna tell you some more general introduction to NFTs. Um, so first of all, hello, and uh, thank you for being here. Welcome to everyone. Um, so uh, we are here to talk about NFTs today uh, in this presentation, uh, what they stand for and how they're changing the process for artists and creators. Um, NFTs are a small part, just a small part of a bigger picture, a bigger picture that involves industries such as uh, finance, games, entertainment, art, many more, as well as traditional other real life sectors and transcends them into the next generation uh, internet, which is called the Web 3.0. Essentially, the, story, the NFT story is a story about the internet. Um, the, yes, so, um, so, sorry Vlad, can you go back? I want to like say a few, a few more things, man. Yeah. So to put that in perspective, I mean the story of the internet, to put that in perspective, almost 30 years ago, uh, the World Wide Web revolutionized information with emails, static HTML websites, etc. A few years later, the second, um, the second generation of the internet, Web 2.0, revolutionized social uh, interactions, for example, with e-commerce platforms, social media, like the ones we're all using today. Um, Despite being still at its infancy, Web 3.0 has already revolutionized uh, value, sorry, uh, trade. So as in peer-to-peer -peer agreements and the exchange of value to previously unexplored territories. Web 3.0 is here and is promising to um, shift the current paradigm, a paradigm where institutions and tech giants in the likes of Amazon, Google, Facebook, etc., are monopolizing digital services and they're capitalizing on our interactions or user interactions, whether that would be social, personal, or financial. So, wait a second. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> so, I just wanted to say, um, how could one explain Google without mentioning what the internet is? In the same way, we cannot talk about NFTs without mentioning some fundamentals about the underlying framework. So, um, in the current era, the era of Web 2.0, 
uh, all of these institutions and companies that handle all user data do that in a centralized fashion. However, in Web 3.0, uh, there is an alternative solution to that, which is based on distributed ledger technology. Uh, this is a very broad term, and it refers, in contrast to centralized servers and data storage, it refers to a more uh, distributed model, according to which uh, a database is spread across various people and or locations. Um, the notorious term of blockchain is essentially a type of a DLT, which is not just distributed, it's decentralized. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, um, a few things that make blockchain special um, is first of all that it's public. Public means that it's accessible to anyone as long as you have an internet connection and a device that can access it. There, there are no strings attached. You can use it independently of who you are, where you are, and what your background is. That's very important. Um, secondly, it's secure, which means that um, Actually, it's secure because it uses some advanced cryptographical methods. Um, third, it's decentralized. As we mentioned before, there is no central point of authority controlling all of this data, which is very important. And last but not least, it's immutable, which in, in simple terms, it means essentially that data is very hardly, uh, can be very hardly altered, modified, erased, or whatever, once they're deployed on chain. Um, sorry, I want to make one more point. Yep. <laughs> um, so one common misconception about the blockchain in general is that it's, it's, it's all about cryptocurrencies. Uh, however, this is not the case. Actually, it's all about decentralization. Um, this common misconception exists because, as you might have heard of Bitcoin, which was the first blockchain that network that popularized this technology, um, Bitcoin basically decentralized financial transactions and um, it showed us how decentralization is a realistic possibility, which is very important. However, moving on to the next slide, a few years later, Ethereum, which is a different network, a different blockchain, uh, came out and built on top of the advancement of Bitcoin, which is the decentralized transactions. Uh, Ethereum is important to mention when we're talking about NFTs because it's essentially the founding mother of NFTs, of the NFT technology. And some important points about the Ethereum blockchain is, first of all, that it's uh, open source and it's public, anyone can access it. And uh, the most important innovation is that it's programmable. Um, what does it mean that it's programmable? Essentially, Ethereum blockchain is using smart contracts Smart contract functionality. Now, smart contracts might sound like a confusing term. However, we can uh, imagine smart contracts as uh, digital contracts that essentially mimic real world uh, contracts. There is an if then function, and when the conditions are met, the function is implemented. Uh, the important thing about smart contracts is that they are automated. Once they are deployed on the blockchain, they run as programmed forever automatically. Now, some developers and community members and programmers within the Ethereum uh, blockchain, they utilize smart contract functionality to deploy and come out with several tools and services which are broadly referred to as decentralized applications or dApps. Um, a special kind of smart contract, a special category of smart contract is responsible for registering ownership, which is essentially the backbone for NFTs. Um, Vlad, Vlad will explain you some more about uh, the non-fungible tokens. Hi, thanks, Andrew. Hey, everyone. I'm Vladimir Spelivanidis. I'm mostly known as Ross Paley in the crypto sphere. And let's dive into NFTs. Like to better understand what an NFT is, let's take uh, where the abbreviation comes from. And as Andrew mentioned previously. Uh, Let's start from the second part, which is a token. Uh, a token can be a digital identifier, like a Bitcoin is a token, Ethereum is a token as currencies, but uh, a token can be also uh, an ownership contract such as NFTs, and in general, if you're familiar with uh, internet, APIs, and, and et cetera, 
Uh, a token is essentially a digital proof of something. Uh, the first part, non-fungible. Uh, fungibility mostly is important, or it refers to scarcity. And to give you like a real life example, imagine a five, uh, five euro bill, for example, like a five euro bill is interchangeable with any other five euro bill. Like you can change it, you don't have to worry if this is the real one or if it has the same value with another five euro bill. So in this case, a five euro bill is fungible. A non-fungible uh, element or a non-fungible token in this case would be something that's unique uh, it's not interchangeable and it has uh, like a, a proof, there's a, a, a public and transparent proof that this asset is uh, something very specific. For example, uh, let's take Mona Lisa or like any popular painting you might uh, have in your mind. Uh, you know, we, we know that there might be millions of copies of Mona Lisa or, or uh, you know, counterfeits, but we can be assured that there is only one original piece and it's proven by you know, the, the issuer of the asset. In this case, I assume it would be the Louvre Museum. Uh, so yeah, pretty much this is where NFTs come from, like what, what it stands for. Uh, uh, so what could be an NFT? The, uh, I think that anything you could imagine or anything that subject to ownership could be manifested into a non-fungible token. Uh, but uh, in this case, let's, let's imagine that we browse through a popular NFT marketplace. Like these are some of the uh, types of assets we would come across. Uh, so you see visual assets and art, that would be anything like pictures, GIFs, PNG uh, files. It can be a video, an audiovisual file. Uh, and all of them, uh, they can be either digital or physical. I'm uh, gonna talk a little bit in depth about that later, but uh, next we have audible assets and music, pre pretty self-explanatory. Again, we can uh, create digital, uh, digitally verifiable ownership contracts that uh, attribute to some musical track, musical works, or even like a physical vinyl, CD, cassette, etc. Uh, we have wearable assets, fashion and jewelry, and everything like under this uh, category. Uh, which means that there, there are a lot of digital wearables. Not sure how many of you are familiar with the video game world, but there are a lot of skins pe people could buy, a lot of, let's say, costumes they would buy in virtual reality realms uh, to kind of decorate their avatars and etc. And uh, all that could be NFTs. But of course, uh, there is a small group of uh, projects that are working on tokenizing physical assets, like physical fashion wearables and some of them include some really big brands. Uh, we have expiring assets, tickets, and consumables. Uh, that would be NFTs that work as access points. Essentially, uh, owning one of these NFTs, you could enter a specific geolocation, or you could enter a virtual domain, like a Discord server, uh, like a private virtual reality room, uh, or something uh, in these premises. And lately, we see some literature, poems, and even zines like NFT Magazine or like the Red Lion Gazette uh, popping out, which are basically like PDFs or they could be something like Issue, if you're familiar with the platform, but again, manifested as uh, NFTs. Sorry, Cortana is listening here. Uh, so, we're here to focus, like we're not going to go into technicalities, into how NFTs uh, work in the back end, but we're going to focus on NFTs and art, uh, which is also the concept of today's event, and how uh, we're going to try to explain why it is important for artists, why so many artists are, you know, jumping into this NFT train, why it's so popular, so hyped, especially this year that is considered to be, uh, 2021 is considered to be the year of NFTs, undeniably. Um, right, so currently uh, the majority of the arsenal of uh, NFTs, especially around art, would be comprised of uh, digital art and there are a, a couple of good reasons for that. Uh, first of all, digital art is very easy to create using digital software, uh, easy to manage, store and obviously upload and register to uh, digital environments such as the Ethereum blockchain uh, or any other distributed ledger. And uh, secondly, uh, I'm sorry for that. 
second important um, reason on why this uh, artist decide to go with an NFT is because NFTs essentially solve most, if not all, the problems artists are currently facing when trying to publish their work in the traditional uh, in a traditional manner. Uh, so why it's a perfect match? Uh, before I dive into details for each one of these uh, pinpoints, let's say. Uh, I'd like to briefly, you know, give you an idea. Probably most of you, if you're artists or you you have artists friends, you would know that, you know, publishing your work can be frustrating, especially analogizing the fact that there are so many intermediaries involved, like uh, agencies or like talent management agencies, record labels, notaries. Uh, all this extra process can be frustrating for the artist. The, the, the whole process can be a little bit uh, inaccessible for some, uh, for some artists, but also it, uh, it's kind of, I think it's tailored to leech out of uh, the artist's creations instead of empowering the artist. So the, the, the model we currently follow is that, you know, we, we're gonna market an artist like the best way we can, we're gonna use the best industry practices to sell this piece, but obviously the artist is gonna make like 10, 20, 25% uh, out of the earnings, uh, in most cases, at least in, in big uh, companies. So why is it's a perfect match, uh, NFT and art, why is it a, it's a perfect match? First of all, there are no intermediaries, which means like, unfortunately, we didn't optimize the the presentation for this split screen, but um, no intermediaries means that there are no uh, leeches, that there are no agencies involved, there are no notaries involved, no contracts, no anything, which means that the artist uh, is directly linked with his audience, is directly linked to potential earnings go directly to the artist, and obviously you don't have to wait like the end of the working month so you get paid, but the 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 payment is automatically directed to the wallet of the artist, uh, in this case the creator of an NFT, of a hypothetical NFT. Next point is undeniable ownership, which again means uh, we can easily track and verify the authenticity of, uh, of an NFT, kind of say um, who is the creator of this NFT, uh, what's the history of this NFT, uh, which comes to the real, uh, next point, real-time tracking, uh, we can tell how many hands an NFT asset has changed, which were the owners, uh, under what circumstances, what pricing, and in some cases even like where uh, is this NFT used, like it was presented in some gallery, if it's a musical track, some fancy DJ played it in, in his set, uh, or in a, like a virtual reality club or something. We can track all this information uh, in a public fashion. Uh, global 24-7 market, this is very important because in the traditional scene, uh, I'm sorry, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say that, but it's like a pain in the ass to buy and sell art, especially if you are talking about physical art, uh, with all the processes in involved, like you have to work in, uh, under the 9 to 5, Monday to Friday uh, rest restrictions. And also, you know, it might, sometimes it might take uh, a week, maybe a month, maybe more, to get your hands on the actual piece you're buying. Uh, this is not happening with NFTs exactly because it relies on blockchain, which is a technology running 24 seven across all the globe and you can instantly access it from anywhere in the world as long as you have internet connection. That means that even if it's like Sunday, uh, 1 a.m. or something, I could uh, buy you know, an art piece from a guy from Taiwan, even if he's not popular, even if no agency wants to work with him, but he really, you know, he really wants to push his art out. Uh, last but not least, automated lifelong royalties. This is something super important for artists, and most of the artists that join the scene are interested in this. Not gonna go into detail, as there is a demonstration in the next slides elaborating on that matter, but in essence, uh, in the traditional scene, let's say you, you sell an art piece for a hundred bucks, somebody buys it and he resells it for a million. You as an artist make this 100 bucks, but you have no right to claim anything uh, from that million, right? Because it's, it's already uh, somebody else's piece and uh, somebody else's assets, even though it's your creation, uh, 
but he will decide how much he will sell it for, to whom, and obviously he's making most of the cash. In the NFT, again, uh, Andrew mentioned smart contracts, and this is super important here because smart contracts uh, ensure, or they could ensure in some cases, that every time a secondary sale happens or a third party sale happens, the initial creator of the NFT, he still benefits from that, sometimes up to 10% of the sales. Uh, again, uh, uh, Max is gonna show you more of that in the next slides. Uh, before we jump into that, uh, let's check some of the recent stats. Uh, on the right side of the screen, you can see uh, a chart that I think runs from the beginning of the year, yep. And it basically shows the uh, user activity rate, like uh, how, how many users we have over time. And you see that uh, this month, in particular, like this summer, but in particular in September, October, we have a huge spike in user activity. And on the left side of the screen, you can see that some interesting stats like uh, from the last 30 days. Like these are not super fresh. We take them like a couple of days ago, but uh, they're pretty much there. So we have 150 active wallets uh, bought and sold at least one NFT in the last 30 days. 150k. Yeah. I think that, that's sorry, fascinating because you know uh, at least one NFT means that in most cases these guys would put more like uh, collectors usually when they go after a collection or after a specific artist they would buy like a series or like a batch of this artist collection. Uh, in most cases, believing kind of like in a future value, they, they try to flip these NFTs, as we call it, uh, potentially for a higher price from what they bought it for. Uh, we can see that nearly $2 billion worth of crypto are spent on NFTs, again, in the last 30 days alone. Uh, I'm not sure of the exact number, but I can speculate that around $200 billion are currently locked uh, in NFT assets. Uh, most interesting part, more than half of that is attributed to secondary sales, which means royalties. And I think, Max, you can uh, take over. Again, uh, before you start, I'm sorry for, not sure if you can access all of them, but you probably can access the first and the third QR. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thanks, Vlad. So we have prepared three QR codes here, I think because of... Does it work? Can you scan it from a screen? Nice. All right. <clears throat> We're also gonna show it to you on screen in, in case you don't have a smart device with you. So basically these three QR codes are three different examples of what NFTs can be or look like. This is the first one I picked, and the point being here is that this is an example of an NFT as art. This black and red animated image that you can see in the middle is an NFT made by the artist named X Copy. By now he's one of the most famous artists. The point I wanted to show you here is that this piece was created about three years ago, and a little bit, I think three months, if you scroll up a bit, you can see he immediately started to get offers for an art piece. And you can see that about three months after he created it, he chose to accept an offer for half an Ethereum, which at this time was $88. If you scroll up a bit more, you can see that about two years ago, the person who bought the art piece chose to sell it again. This time it was sold for 10 Ethereum which at the time had a market value of about 1.5K. Seven days ago, this piece was sold again. This time it was sold for 1,000 Ethereum, which at the current market capitalization is about $3 million. I wanted to show you here not just the data and the publicity and the ownership records you can see for an art piece, but I wanted to highlight what royalties means. So our friend X Copy here, who has originally created an art piece that he personally sold for $88, one week ago while sleeping, he made $300,000 in royalties. And nobody had to pay this to him, nobody had to send him the money, nobody was able to cheat him or try to keep this a secret, because the smart contract automatically executed this function and put this money in his wallet. 
The second example I want to show you is another utility of NFTs. This would be an example of an NFT being a domain name. Just like we have domain names in the Web2 environment, such as Facebook.com or PlayStation2.com, there are also domain names in the Web3 environment. They usually, or for now, they end in .eth. At least in the Ethereum blockchain. As a third example, one I wanted to show you really quick is, this is an example of an NFT as virtual estate. For this, maybe really quick, I have to say a few words about the metaverse. A metaverse is a virtual environment, a virtual reality, if you want, with real life aspects. This is an example of one of the metaverses out there. It's called Crypto Voxels. You can see that Vlad is going to now take you through a little tour of one of the art galleries in Crypto Voxels. And we didn't pick this at random. It's, it's actually our gallery and our headquarter. I have to. Sorry, guys. I'm going to just take the volume out. There is some nice Drexia tracks playing, if you're interested. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm going to try my best. Basically, this is a virtual environment where uh, initially the, the NFT in this case is the parcel or the land piece itself. So, people would buy or be, one can build anything in this um, in this virtual environment is also scarce. So that means that it's like a real city, it has like real boundaries, and there is like a real way to kind of split all these different parcels or land pieces. And each one of them is literally an NFT. That means that people can buy these land pieces and they can do whatever they want. Like some of them will build like a personal virtual house or something, uh, or a lounge. Some of them would use them as galleries like we do. Uh, there are crypto art museums, there are nightclubs, there are pretty much anything you can imagine and can be, of course, supported uh, in a digital environment. And the best part about this is that everything in here is pretty much everything is interactive and in most cases an NFT. For example, these art pieces, instead of like going to a traditional gallery where you'll see, you know, a, a picture or a painting, an NFT can be animated, it can be a GIF, it can be MP4, it can be like an audiovisual piece. And in this sort of galleries, in virtual reality galleries, not only you can have like, obviously like a more fancy colors or whatever like stuff you won't see in real life, but you can host animated uh, versions of your art that again, users can directly interact with. So I can click on that, I can go to OpenSea, which is like a popular uh, NFT market and buy the piece instantly. Uh, Something super important I think we, we should mention is that the Web3, as Andrew mentioned, so Web2 is cloud, you know, Web2 web, web is kind of like the centralized storage and management system of information. It means that, you know, if you log into your Gmail account, whether it's from your personal handheld device or from a third-party computer or like from your friend's computer, you're going to be still able to access your email because it's not stored in the device, it's, it's stored in Google server and you just access it. Uh, in the Web3, uh, what happens is that the information is stored on chain and you can uh, log in into these environments, into any Web3 environment. In this case, we're looking at crypto voxels uh, with your wallet, which also works as, let's say, like a digital identity or Web3 identity to tap into these worlds. You can interact pretty much with any decentralized application, whether that's a game, a financial tool, it can be like a uh, NFT platform where you mint NFTs, similar to how you log in to Web2 platforms with your Facebook account or your Google account. In the crypto space, you could log in with your MetaMask account, let's say, or the wallet, the Web3 wallet you'd prefer. So we're not going to go uh, uh, into depth, but you can see like this is a full-blown world. There are a lot of parcels. Can you hold this for me, please? So. You check that this, like our parcel is in Gangnam district, it's like an area full of art, music, like uh, artistic kind of aesthetic. And it's like a huge world, you can't see everything, like it's misty, but as, as we progress, uh, there are stuff coming uh, into life. 
And all of these parcels, all of these land pieces are NFTs. As a last thing, could you please show uh, the billboard, Vlad? Thank you. So as we have showed you our headquarters and our gallery, you can see some Agora Reworks posters here also. Um, it's also important to know that these worlds are basically a virtual representation of our worlds. So just like in the real world, we have museums, we have art galleries or advertisement, a very similar thing has happened in the metaverse. Yeah, that's usually what happens when Flat's on the computer. He, he doesn't stop, he just keeps on going. But let's, uh, let's continue our presentation. I would like to invite you to take a very quick tour through Rare Candy because I think of the, a lot of the things we talked about are quite abstract. So I wanted to show you a more concrete example what exactly it means for an artist to work with someone and to publish a digital art piece. So just as a very general sentence, we at Rare Candy 3D we are a publishing house for rare and unique digital and physical assets registered on the Ethereum blockchain. Our philosophy, our unique value proposition, or a reason why we came up with all of these ideas, you can see here. So as, as you might notice now, you can see that there are quite some prerequisites. There are quite some things you have to know in order to access this technology to create something and uh, etc. So for us, it was very important to make it accessible for everyone, independently if they're 18 or 80, independently of where they come from, independently of their religious, section, sexual orientation, ethnicity or country of origin. We want to do this not just through making it accessible, but by teaching the people how exactly it works. By educating people to be able to navigate the space. And we did this by founding the Rare Candy 3D Academy, where with a series of articles, small videos, etc., the artists can learn and ultimately be able to do all of these things by themselves if wanted. It so also was very important for us to help artists that are not so familiar with the space to help them with distribution and delivery. And another core value for us at Rare Candy is innovation, to stay on top of the NFT game. How I said, we're still at a very early stage and to push the boundaries of what's possible with NFTs. Before we start to tell you how exactly it works, I would just like to say one sentence. I hope you're not confused. Rare Candy 3D is not a blockchain, although we have our own coin. Rather, we are leveraging and using open source technologies from projects like us. So we're also trying to give back, to pass on, to teach, and to empower artists especially. So a very quick and rough chronological thing that would describe how an artist would release an NFT. First, there's the scouting. When we started, there weren't many NFT artists, so we were actually approaching artists ourselves and we were asking if we could educate them about NFTs and if they would like to do a release with us. Now it works more on a commission basis where artists contact us. When we agree on something, we help the artists to create a concept and more importantly, to create a story around the art piece. Also, we help with the NFT formatting because there are dimensions that are limited, there are pixel sizes that are limited, and they can also vary across different platforms. And this can be also very confusing and overwhelming at the beginning for the artists. Another very important thing for us as the whole, one of the main points of this technology is decentralization, or in another way said, we want to democratize these technologies. It was very important for us that we don't discriminate. And the creation and deployment of a contract, if you want to be able to interact with the blockchain, it will cost you some money. Now, an initial investment of $50 might be possible for me, but for somebody who lives in a poorer country, $50 might be half of his wage. For a person such as this, it would be impossible to enter this market. 
So we also decided that we're going to cover all of the initial investments so that the artists, independently where they come from, independently from their financial situation, can access this technology. Also, we found out that it's very important that we help the artists sell their pieces. It's very important to do this not just through traditional marketing, through magazines, through podcasts, or to spreading the word in speeches just like this, but it's also very important to do Web3 marketing. For example, the billboard Flood just showed you in our parcel. Because with the Web3 crowd, you are basically talking about people who are very familiar with the space, who love the technology, who have their own parcels, and most of the time also have the necessary change to give the artists a very good deal on their art. Also, we are presented or we're helping the artists to get listed at a plethora of marketplaces, not just one, independently of their prerequisites. And we also help with metaverse listings. So as I mentioned, just like in the real world, there are galleries, there are museums. For example, in the, in the crypto voxels, we have the Museum of Modern Art that displays actually NFT technologies. So we also help artists not just getting listed and having their pictures displayed in virtual galleries, but also potentially get listed at museums, etc. And, and finally, we really value transparency. So one of our main goals is to teach the artists how to track, monitor, and evaluate their royalties in real time. We want the artists to be able to navigate the blockchain and the DLT scene comfortably. While at the beginning, we might act more as a middleman, the ultimate goal is to empower the artists, independently of anything else, to be able to use this amazing technology that we think has many, many more use cases and an amazing time to come. So this was our presentation so far. And if you have any questions, now would be a great time to ask them. I know that all of these words, all of these terms, all of these things can be very overwhelming and they can seem quite crazy at the beginning, but the deeper you dive into it, more and more things start to make sense. And we're not just here during the Q&A, also during this event, if we can help you with anything, if we can answer any questions, if there's anything you would like to have explained in more detail, we will be here all day and we're more than happy to explain and help anyone. Now, I'm not sure how we're going to do this with the microphone, but I guess I'm going to give you mine. Hello, I'm Andre from Austria, and I'm an artist and an engineer as well. So I uh, know the technical side of this, but I have a lot of questions to you, but I will focus on one. And I will elaborate a bit, I think. We live in a world of growing wealth and more and more people have the possibility to do art. And as digital technologies arise, even more people can do art. Everyone can produce music now. Everyone can do so many stuff in this living room at this point. So with this, we have a marketplace, which is like if you call it a marketplace, but in your world it is a marketplace, which is growing and growing and growing. And I ask myself, like for me as an artist, I have, for me the most important thing is to have a physical connection, to have emotions with my audience, to share this. And how do you think these two worlds can coexist with this kind of technique? Because I don't think they can. So maybe this like, yeah. That's a super interesting and super important question. And the thing is that most people who come into the scene, they think that NFTs is just about art. It's just like fancy PNGs or fancy GIFs, fancy cats videos, you know, uh, that people buy for crazy amounts of money or in terms of crypto at least. But the truth is, and uh, 
we, we, we kind of underlined that in the beginning of the speech that an NFT is essentially a digitally verifiable ownership contract. It's similar to traditional ownership contracts in the sense that uh, it implies who is the owner of a specific asset, whether that's digital or physical. It doesn't matter. It can be a physical, it can be real estate, it can be a car, it can be a physical painting, it can be a dog pet degree even. You know, you can do an NFT out of anything. It doesn't have to be uh, necessarily art. And if we take some of the big uh, industry leaders on how they leverage this technology, for example, IBM, Walmart, all these big brands, Carrefour even, uh, they are into NFTs, but you, you probably haven't heard of that because they are not selling videos of cats. They use this technology in the supply chain industry. So, uh, for example, you know, you go to a Walmart store, you scan the QR of a milk bottle, and you can track its history. You can see, you know, who's the producer of this milk, what kind of cows does he has, what he feeds his cows with, who was transferring this milk from the production facility to the uh, supermarket, you know, who was doing the packaging, which brand. All this information can be tracked uh, stored publicly and everyone could access it just by scanning a QR code. While in the traditional space, like you can, obviously we can still sell milk or tomatoes or apples or whatever, but it's very easy and especially in Greece, uh, you know, we see anyone can bring, let's say, some apples from another country that are cheap uh, and baptize them as Greek apples and sell them without any, any issues. You know, nobody could tell. So there, there's a lot potential of how NFTs could be utilized to solve like real life problems besides art. But again, currently 90% of NFTs is, uh, are revolving around art exactly because it's easy, as you mentioned also, it's easy to create, easy to deploy and easy to market and eventually make money out of it, right? I would also like to add something. First of all, I absolutely love your socks. They're amazing. And I would like to try to answer your question a bit more. Um, I think it's not upon us to decide. I think there might very well be artists who say, look, I cannot have this emotional connection with digital art. And there might be consumers who say, I'm not buying this art because for me the emotional connection is lacking. But if we look at the numbers, we see a different trend. We see that people absolutely love also this kind of art. I don't think this is going to eradicate all other kinds of arts, but I think that's something each artist and each consumer has to decide there for themselves. We are not there to like make or create these rules, but I think this is going to be one of the interesting questions of the future. Is this technology, are consumers, are artists going to adapt it on a large scale, or is it going to stay a niche product? We have a second question. Then. I hope that answered it somewhat. I would love to talk to you afterwards. Hello, my name is Eric. I'm 32 years old. I live in Paris, France. Uh, I didn't know much about NFT before today. Uh, I don't think I want to use it, but your presentation was very interesting. So thank you very much for that. Thank you for the feedback. And we had a third one here. Hi, um, thank you for the presentation. I have one question is about the energy and the ecological impact of, of such a technology. Because if it's a wider market, wider and wider, um, and the blockchain can use a lot of energy, so how can we resolve this? I would like to answer this question. Um, as a young person, I think climate change is one of the pressing issues we have to care about. And it's true that the blockchain is using energy, but I think it's very important to put this in perspective. So everybody knows Visa, right? The card payment service. If Visa does 100,000 transactions, they're using about 150 kilowatt of energy. If the same transactions, 100,000, happen on the Ethereum blockchain, it only uses about 17 kilowatts of energy. So it uses effectively only 11% of the energy that we're using right now. And that's only the current stage. There already are models proposed that 100,000 transactions on the Ethereum blockchain would only use 0.1 kilowatts of energy. And that's the current stage, the infancy that we're in. So yes, it's true that blockchain is using energy, but you also have to understand that it's using even less energy than the systems we're using right now. And ultimately, it's not just about the energy, but about the way how we get this energy. And I think this is going to be the, the, the pressing questions, but it's a very common thing. It's something that if you have a conversation for more than 10 minutes about NFTs, you have to talk about the CO2 footprint because it's extremely important. 
But how I said, if you put it in perspective, it's insane to even realize that it's taking only 11% in this case of the technology that we're using right now. Nobody's talking about how much energy banks are wasting or how much energy gold mining is wasting. And if you compare it to this, it's using much, much, much less. I, I hope this answers your question. I think we have time for another question from the public. Yeah. If you can even introduce yourself, maybe. Hi, my name is Kirill. Uh, I'm one of the editors of Are We Europe, which is the magazine you see lying around. But my question is actually related to uh, my side work as a musician and an artist, because I'm actually working on my first release this year. And I think what you said about marketing, uh, maybe you could explain a little bit more how you support artists in your work and what kind of the benefits are uh, to work with something like Rare Candy versus, you know, traditional, you know, Spotify release, YouTube video, et cetera, et cetera, because it, it feels like it's still quite early stages. And so I'm curious about what kind of audience you reach and whether that is a, a traditional audience or not. Hey, man. Uh, so we haven't explored a lot the musical scene, although we have already one musical release that's also physical. It's like a single edition physical vinyl uh, that's backed by an NFT. Uh, I wouldn't say that in terms of promotion, it's not that you're going to get a lot of listeners, but if you are going to sell one NFT, you're definitely going to make much more than 10 traditional releases, even if you cut like three, 500 vinyl, right? And what we mean by uh, doing this uh, extra, you know, taking this extra step in marketing in Web3 is that uh, we are in the scene since the beginning. All through Rare Candy started in early 2020. We are uh, involved in the NFTs. We are collecting NFTs since the very beginning. And uh, therefore, we are very close to some of the biggest collectors, some of the biggest houses. And in, with most of them, we have like personal relationships and we are very uh, comfortable, let's say, to ask them to list our stuff in their galleries or uh, uh, write an article about us uh, that are, t in most cases, are targeted to a crypto audience, like to people who are not just going to listen to this music and say like, hey, I really like this, but I'm not sure how to how do i actually buy it but it's literally people who already have a setup wallet they probably have like hundreds maybe more ethereum in their wallet and it's more most more likely that they would buy an nft music release rather than a traditional release even if it's cheaper right uh, i'm not sure if this answers uh, your question okay so i would invite everyone big round of applause again for Max, Ross, and Andro, thanks a lot. It was a splendid presentation, exciting. You're welcome. Um, now it's uh, time to chill with purpose. Um, we, you can all meet this Ferra team outside. Um, there are representatives from many organizations from different countries of Europe who made a trip to come here to Thessaloniki to meet you, to have a chat, relaxed chat. We can discuss about what Ferra is about what each media partner does. Just to give you a brief uh, overview, we have uh, Antinea Ladomska from Dynamo, which is a video production agency from Italy. Antinea, please raise your hand so that everyone knows who you are. Uh, we have Kirill from Are We Europe, a pan-European magazine, so cool, you can't believe it. You have to watch it and you can discuss many things. They just launched an agency, which is really cool. We have Antoine Lereux from Bull Media, which is a podcast production agency based in Brussels. We have Cecile from Artifati, you can raise your hand, raise it, raise it, raise it, uh, event organizer from Lyon, and Eric and Maria from Streetless over there, which is a video media uh, in France focusing on suburbs of big cities in France, I would say, and then there is Bubble International, Francois Family, CEO, leader of the Sphera project, so we wait for you outside, have a coffee, have lunch, we have a drink, and we chat. Thank you. <laughs>